I'm glad you're all here. You can help me spread the word. Which word? Well, Mr. Dragon has the flu. You want everyone to know that? No, he's faculty advisor for the Poets' Corner. Oh, and they're sponsoring the Speaker's Assembly today. Right, and since Mr. Dragon's absent, it's my job to see that there's somebody in the auditorium besides the eight members of the Poets' Corner and me. Who's the speaker? Oh, Edith Appleton Tope. Who? Edith Appleton Tope. She's a poetess. And a very good one. She writes sonnets, odes, Alexandrian epics. Something for everyone. I don't think the students are going to line up to hear sonnets, odes, and Alexandrian epics. Well, they just might like Miss Tope if they give her a chance. And Mr. Dragon says she's another Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Oh. Well, any student interest you can drum up will be appreciated. Well, we'll do what we can. Okay. Edith Appleton Tope. Well, if you can't get Ella Wheeler Wilcox. There are a lot of speakers that could pack that auditorium. People with kids would be interested in. Yeah. Well, for what it's worth, we're not the only school having the problem. The school board may cut off the speaker's fund entirely. You know, I still think that fund shouldn't be available just to organize clubs. Well, that's the problem. You see, the speakers appeal to just the club members and nobody else. I've been trying to get the board to change the policy. Any chance? Well, George Franklin is the stumbling block. He'd like to cancel the whole thing. And save money. How'd you guess? I have another meeting with him, but I tell you, if I have to report to old George that nobody showed up at today's lecture, I'm going to have two chances of changing old George's mind, slim and none. I see you. Hey, you better hurry. You're going to be late. Late? Late for what, Miss Johnson? Today's speaker, Edith Appleton Tope. That's who it is. Well, we were reminded, but poetry, Miss Johnson. Nick, I thought you prided yourself on being open-minded. Mark says that unless it serves to liberate the oppressed, poetry has no utility. Hmm? Who knows? You may be liberated. Well, Miss Johnson, you don't have to hurry. There will be plenty of seats. Mm. Why don't they bring in speakers who have something relevant to say to us? Relevant to you and to us are two different things, Nick. But there's no reason why we shouldn't have speakers we want to hear. At least there'll be something to think about. Yeah, before we've decided not to go. Uh, Mr. Dixon, can you spare me a few minutes? Sure, Nick. I'd like to organize a new club here at school. Oh, what kind of club? A Marxist-Lenin society. Are you serious? I sure am. Nick, what's turned you on to Marx and his philosophy in such a big way? Everywhere I look, Mr. Dixon, I, I see such terrible inequalities. It, it makes me mad. Look, I'd like to see everybody get their fair share, too, but uh, I haven't seen any proof that Marx and Lenin have the answer. Maybe, maybe everyone will agree with you. Maybe I, I won't even get one member. But don't I have the right to try? Yes, you do have that right. I knew you'd be fair about it. That's why I want you to be the club's faculty advisor. <laughs> no, thanks, Vic. You know, the one thing that makes this country healthy is the free expression of all ideas, including yours and your friends. But since I don't share your point of view, that rules me out as faculty advisor. If you turn me down, there won't be a club. No other teacher would be fair enough to sponsor me. Oh, I don't think that's necessarily true. I do. This means a lot to me, Mr. Dixon. And you said the left and the right have a lot of worthwhile ideas. You said we shouldn't just listen to one point of view. You said if all you hear is what you already know... Before you start doing any organizing, remember, Mr. Kaufman has to authorize the club. I'll get his permission. Okay. You get his permission and I'll serve as faculty advisor. How many students showed up at the lecture? I'd say there were about 30 when it started. Maybe 15 when it was over. The kids just won't open themselves up to anything new. You say poetry and they slam the door. I sympathize with you, Miss Johnson. Still, I do think Edith Appleton Tope's appeal will always be somewhat limited. I suppose so. But I don't agree with Mr. Dragon. I never compare her with Ella Wheeler Wilcox. No. No, she's closer to Lizette Woodworth Reese. Mr. Kaufman? Oh, Mr. Franklin, well, this is a surprise. Uh, uh, Miss McIntyre, Miss Johnson, uh, this is Mr. Franklin of the school board. I saw the ladies in the auditorium. Oh, you heard the speaker. Oh, well, we better be going. Bye-bye. Mm. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, uh, what did you think of uh, Edith Appleton Tope? Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that when you've heard one poem, you've heard them all, but... Uh, uh, I take it Miss Tope is not your favorite. From the size of the audience, she's not anybody's favorite. You're beating a dead horse, Mr. Kaufman. 
Well, why don't we try to find a way to keep the horse alive? In Miss Tope's case, we're using a very good figure of speech. I've been looking for you. Oh, what's the problem? Nick Timmons. Yes, huh? Um, a Marx Lenin? Excuse me. A Marx Lenin society with you as the faculty advisor? Shall we go up or down? Down, it's easier. Excuse me. How come you agreed to be faculty advisor? Well, he quoted some words about the free exchange of ideas. From Karl Marx and Pete Dixon. Yes, for it, huh? Well, maybe next week he'll be into Nietzsche or Thomas Aquinas or somebody. The society welcomes dissension, Nancy. Join up, if you're not afraid to honestly examine your attitudes. Look, I'm not afraid, but the whole idea bores me. Yeah, yakking about Marx and Lenin and... We'll have lots of activities, too. Such as? Well, on May Day, we'll have a big picnic. Lots of red ants. <laughs> and I've got another idea just in the planning stage that could really set this school on its ear. No, thanks. You know, maybe I might stop by at the picnic. Jason, how about you? The Marx-Lenin Society needs you. You need it. We're gonna have to struggle alone, man, without each other. I'd be honored to have you as my first member. I'm not a member of anything except the human race, and then nobody asked me did I want to join that. But the club's a natural for you. Anybody say club, and I cover my head. Mr. Dixon. Oh, Nick, how's it going? Not so good. Well, how's the membership drive coming? It takes time for an idea to catch on. What we need is something to spark interest in the society. You know, you might have to face the possibility that interest doesn't exist. Mr. Dixon, as a recognized club here at Walt Whitman, we have the right to draw on the speaker's fund, haven't we? Yes. We're going to sponsor a speaker who'll fill that auditorium and have everybody in this school talking about the Marx-Lenin Society. Who have you got in mind? Oscar Smith. Oscar Smith? The Oscar Smith. One of the Tulsa Ten. I wrote to him asking if he'd consider speaking here, sponsored by the Society. Here's his answer. Would be delighted, any fee acceptable, consider it an honor and a sacred obligation to share my experiences with young people. Very truly yours, Oscar Smith. That kind of unselfish idealism is what the movement's all about. You don't seem very pleased, Mr. Dixon. Nick, you asked me to be faculty advisor, but you didn't ask for my advice. I didn't want to bother you. You mean you didn't want to hear the reasons why Oscar Smith wouldn't be a suitable speaker for a high school lecture series? Well, don't you think the kids will turn out to hear him? Oh, I'm sure they would. I really haven't done anything I shouldn't have done, Mr. Dixon. You can still say no. I know that. Are you going to? Or will you ask for the money from the speaker's fund? I'll discuss it with Mr. Kaufman. He was one of the Tulsa Ten. The loudest one. The one that was uh, furthest left on all the pictures. That's Oscar Smith. Tried for conspiracy. But not convicted. Look, I don't agree with him, and I know you don't agree with him. But I think the kids have a right to hear him and make up their own minds. <laughs> What's so funny? I was just thinking how George Franklin is going to react to this. Oh, boy, this whole program is hanging by a thread. I know, but I didn't want to just turn it down. No, no, you were right. Why don't we just cool it for a couple of days while I think about it? Oscar Smith. Well, he's certainly no Edith Appleton Tope. I mean, that Marxist oddball thinks he can bring Oscar Smith here to lecture. Oscar Smith. I mean, I can't believe Mr. Kaufman will let Nick invite that long-haired, bearded, un-American radical here at Walt Whitman. Hey, Nance, you just stepped on a lot of toes. Well, I'm going to get a petition together for concerned students. I'd like to hear him speak. He really put on a show at the trial. Did you see it when he was on TV and he played the banjo and sang to the jury? Look, an extremist like Oscar Smith shouldn't be here on, on this campus. 
I'll take that poster. Uh, Mr. Dixon, uh, I would like to protest this proposed appearance. I'm sure you would. I'm not the only one. You wanted to see me, Mr. Dixon? Yes, sit down. I want to talk to you. Why did you put those posters up? Just spreading the good word. Well, you know Mr. Kaufman hasn't authorized Smith's appearance. Not officially. But you wanted to be sure he would by making it as hard as possible for him to refuse. No, sir. Don't con me, Nick. Bringing Oscar Smith here was what you had in mind from the first, right? Sponsoring relevant speakers is one of the most important functions of a club. But first you had to have a club. And to have a club, you had to have a faculty advisor. I was trying to work within the system. What you were trying to do was work yourself into a position of influence with the students. What matters is I'm bringing one of the most vital political figures in the country to the school. Any way you can. So? The end justifies the means. I'd say you'd learn that part of Marxism very well, Nick. Mr. Dixon, there's nobody at this school I respect more than you. You prove that by using me. In a good cause. You should hear the kids. They're really turned on. Well, their excitement is a little bit premature. Mr. Kaufman will give us the okay, won't he? I don't know. But he can't turn us down now. Oh, yes, he can. Nick, nobody likes to be pressured into making a decision. Gee, Pete. Gee, what, Jerry? Well, the whole idea of a guy like that coming to a place like this to speak. You really think it would be that terrible? Well, not terrible, maybe, but not good. Jerry, there's a lot of difference between good and terrible. Well, let's just say the whole thing, uh, how you handled it, Kaufman being on the spot, the speaker's program in jeopardy is unfortunate. You know what I mean? Yes, I get the picture. Well, I've got a class. Uh, we ought to have dinner sometime soon. Yes, yeah, sure. You know, now I understand why you and Liz are always so worried about me. Oh, why is that? Well, you're in the kind of situation that I always get into. And then I wonder how it happened to me. It happens one step at a time. That's the way it always is with me. Now, if we could just figure out which first steps to avoid. You mean if I hadn't become faculty advisor for the Marx Lenin Society? But if you hadn't agreed to it, well, that just wouldn't be you. Thanks, Alice. This man Smith is a revolutionary. He's an anarchist organizer. Well, my office hasn't authorized his appearance. Well, then why have these posters been put up? A student in the club that invited him let his enthusiasm overwhelm his better judgment. Just went ahead without permission, huh? Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear it. What's a Marx-Lenin society doing in a public school anyway? It's an experiment. Whose idea? The same students. For what it's worth, so far he's the president, the vice president, the secretary, treasurer, and the only member. Well, they say it's better to let these kids work these things out by themselves. I don't know. I was told what to do. I accepted it, and it's worked fine for me. Uh, Mr. Franklin, could we get to the point of this meeting? Well, I'll tell you flat out. I've thought about it. I've been around to other schools, and I don't think there's anything to discuss. We've been spending a lot of money on a speaker's program nobody sees. Well, that's the point. If we would change our policy so that the speakers were more relevant to what most of the students want to hear. Now, Oscar Smith... Oh, you made the right decision there. The only decision. No subversive like Smith can be allowed to use the public schools for a platform. Um, I'm afraid you misunderstood me. I haven't made that decision yet. You just told me you turned him down. No, I said... I haven't authorized his appearance, but that's as of now. One minute, you're asking for my support to retain the speaker's fund. And in the next, you're telling me you're thinking of bringing in that wild-eyed radical. I don't understand you, Mr. Kaufman. Mr. Franklin, this school doesn't exist in a vacuum. The students need to know what's going on outside. They're going to be out there pretty soon. When you make your decision, Mr. Kaufman, I want to know. You will. Oh, by the way, when you're thinking about making that decision, I'd like you to keep in mind that not only are you laying the future of the Speaker's Fund on the line, but conceivably, your professional future as well. Why, well, that guy from the school board sure giving old Mr. Kaufman a hard time, huh? The usual right of scare tactic. 
Brook, a lecture series paid for by the public, is no place for a man like Oscar Smith. Why not? He plays good band, Joe. If he's wrong, the best way for us to find out is to listen to what he says. Well, if they turn Oscar down, what can we do? Parade. Pick it. Protest. Oh, I'm sure the school board's going to come out and watch us parade. In unity, their strength. Nick, I don't think Marx and Lennon have the answer to our problem. Only one thing makes me madder than the man telling me I got to listen to somebody is the man telling me I can't listen to somebody. Okay, now the bank holiday wasn't a holiday like Christmas or Fourth of July. It was when President Roosevelt closed all the banks. But well, why do you do that? Because there was a slight shortage of ready cash. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. We'll pick it up here tomorrow. Mr. Dixon, is it true the school board may cut off the speaker's fund? Strong possibility. Because of Oscar Smith? Does it really matter to you? Well, sure it does. We can't let them take away one of our privileges. Why all the concern now? What do you mean? I mean, is it really the speaker's fund you're concerned about, or are you just enjoying the protest? We care. Then why didn't you try to do something about the system of selecting speakers before? We stayed away. That's a negative, Bernie. We agree with you, Mr. Dixon. But when Nick invited Smith, that started us thinking. There could be a committee organized to canvass the students. Why don't we wrap with all the students and take the best suggestions of Mr. Kaufman? It's a good idea. But who's going to be on the committee? Count me in. Uh, you're not going to be on this alone, Nick. I'd like to be on it, too. I got some spare time. Well, it looks like the radical left has activated the far right and the silent majority. What about you, Jason? No way. Somebody's got to be on the outside the community to tell her what is doing wrong. What a morning. I've been helping to answer Mr. Kaufman's phone. W complaints about Oscar Smith? Half the calls are from parents threatening to take their kids out of school if Oscar Smith speaks. And the other half are from people who want tickets for the lecture. Well, when's Mr. Kaufman going to decide? Today, I hope. You know, yesterday, the Poets Corner broke a 45-year-old rule and voted to support the Marx Lennon Society in their right to pick a speaker of their choice. Oh, I just had a mental picture of Edith Appleton Tope and Oscar Smith walking off into the sunset together. What do you got there? Ham and cheese. Ham and cheese? Man, you're living high. <laughs> hey, where's Nick? Nick? I got a telegram from Oscar Smith's agent. His agent? Yeah. The demand for Oscar Smith lecture is very strong. Can you guarantee fee of $1,000 for Walt Whitman appearance? If not, regretfully cancel. Oh, what a bummer. I can't believe it. I can. <laughs> Bob Whitman can't afford that, Mr. Dixon. No way. He sold out. A chance for some quick money, and that's all that counts. There's a little capitalist in all of us, Nick. How could he compromise in everything he said he believed in? What about his obligation to young people? I'm not sure I can answer that for you, Nick. Will you tell Mr. Kaufman? Sure. And Nick, when you finish reading Karl Marx, uh, try Thomas Jefferson. I've got a book at home on Gandhi. You ought to look into it. You might enjoy it. Thanks, Mr. Dixon. Man, it just goes to show you, you can never tell about them banjo players. Well, I called Franklin. I told him that the whole matter had been taken out of my hands. What were you going to do? I was going to let Oscar Smith come and speak. Of course, then I would have had to get somebody from the conservative point of view just to try to keep the whole speaker's fund from being canceled. You know the kids have organized a committee to petition for a change in the program. What are they suggesting? Well, the volunteer committee polled the kids and they came up with a list of speakers they'd like to hear. Well, let's hope this will guarantee an audience. Uh, roughly in order of preference. Angela Davis, Spiro Agnew, Cesar Chavez, Billy Graham, 